Here I've got another video about hypergeometric functions and elliptic integrals and the relation between them. But let's recall a couple of things before we look at our second type of elliptic integral. So for a complex number a, we define the rising factorial, which we denote by a n, where a is in parentheses as a times a plus one times a plus two, all the way up to a plus n minus one. So there are a total of n factors here. Then we can define the following hypergeometric function. So in the previous video, we looked at maybe why it's called a hypergeometric function and a couple of other things. In future videos, we'll dive into special cases of these hypergeometric functions and more well-known functions. So we've got this F21 A, B, C, Z is equal to the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of A, N, B, N over n factorial C, N times Z to the N. So A, B, and C are seen as parameters and Z is like a variable. Maybe it should be pointed out that this converges when modulus of Z is less than 1. Here we can take Z to be a complex number. Furthermore, there's a bit of a restriction on C, which we noted in the last video. I'll let you guys look at that if you need to. So the next thing that we want to look at is something called the complete elliptic integral of the second kind. So we looked at the complete elliptic integral of the first kind in the previous video. And so this one is defined as a function of k, e of k, and it's the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of the square root of 1 minus k squared sine squared theta d theta. So now the first question I want to look at is why elliptic? And we had a bit of a hint last time, but here we can dive into it a little bit more carefully because this complete elliptic integral of the second kind has a clearer path to answer this question, why elliptic? Okay, so let's consider an ellipse x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1 living inside of R2. So notice that we can parameterize this ellipse with the following parameterization. We'll let x equal a cos theta. Then we can let y equal b times sine theta. Furthermore, in order to make the entire ellipse, theta will tend between 0 and 2 pi. And now we can apply the integral formula for the arc length to write down the arc length of this ellipse as an integral. So let's do that. So our arc length will be equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi. That's because we're integrating from, that's because our parameter runs from 0 to 2 pi of the square root of the partial of x with respect to theta squared plus the partial of y with respect to theta squared and then d theta. So that's something that you maybe go over in like a calculus three or multivariable calculus type class and we're gonna, not going to do that here or we're not going to derive that here. Okay, so let's see. That gives us the integral from zero to pi over two and then multiplied by four just using some symmetry about this ellipse, notice that this integral from 0 to pi over 2 will give us a quarter of the ellipse. And then the partial of x with respect to theta will be a squared times sine squared theta. So let's write that down. We have a squared sine squared theta. And then the partial of y with respect to theta squared will be b squared cosine squared theta. And any minus sign that might show up indeed disappears because of our squaring. So the next thing that we could do is maybe take this cosine and write it as 1 minus sine squared. So let's do that. So we'll use the fact that cos squared theta is equal to 1 minus sine squared theta. And then from there we can like collect terms. So that's going to give us 4 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of the square root of 1 minus, let's see what we have. So we'll have b squared minus a squared. So b squared minus a squared times sine squared theta d theta. 
Now let's notice that if we let k squared equal b squared minus a squared, then we have exactly this integral over here. And you might say, what happens if a is bigger than b and we get something that's negative right here? But we can just assume from the beginning that a is less than or equal to b and just switch the role of a and b as needed as that just relates to doing a rotation inside of the xy plane. Okay, that's a quick description of why this is called an elliptic integral. And now I want to prove a nice result that links this type of elliptic integral to hypergeometric functions. So the result that we'll prove is that this elliptic integral of the second kind is equal to this hypergeometric function where our parameters are minus half, half, and one. And then z has been replaced with k squared. So we'll do this just like we did in the previous video, and that's with a straightforward calculation. And we'll use a couple of standard facts along the way, but we'll point those out, those out when we get there. Oh, and I almost forgot, I'm missing a pi over 2. Okay, so let's start with e of k. In other words, our complete elliptic integral of the second kind. So that'll be equal to the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of the square root of 1 minus k times sine theta squared. So I've rewritten it just a little bit. I factored that square out of the k squared times sine squared just to make it look a little bit more friendly for where we're going. And then next, we'll use a binomial expansion. So let's use the fact that one plus x to the alpha expands like the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of the binomial coefficient alpha choose n x to the n. And this converges when the absolute value of x is less than one. And let's notice we have that exact situation where alpha is equal to one half and then x is equal to minus k times sine theta quantity squared, like that. And then this will converge as long as k is less than one, but it will be. Okay, so let's make that expansion and see what we get. So we'll have the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of minus one to the n. That's because we have a minus sign right here. And then next, we will have one half choose n from our binomial coefficient. And then we'll have a k to the two n because we have k squared to the n. And then the rest of that will be within an integral. So this will be the integral from zero to pi halves of sine two n theta d theta. Okay, so that's looking good. And then from here, we wanna apply a power reducing formula for the integral of sine. So let's recall how that looks. So we'll have the integral of sine 2n theta d theta from zero to pi over two, in fact, will be equal to, let's see, it's 2n minus one over 2n times the integral from zero to pi over two of sine 2n minus two theta d theta. And that follows from the standard reduction formula for integrating powers of sine. And so if we had an indefinite integral, there'd be something on the outside here, but that turns into zero because we have bound zero and pi over two. Okay, so now we can repeatedly apply this. And after repeated applications, you'll notice that we'll get 2n minus 1 times 2n minus 3 because we're skipping 2 times 2n minus 5 all the way down to 3 times 1. And so that's kind of known as 2n minus 1 double factorial. And then in the denominator, we'll have 2n times 2n minus 2 times 2n minus 4 all the way down 4 times 2. And then we finally end with the integral of just sine to the 0 from zero to pi over two, but that gives, a, gives us a factor of pi over two. Okay, so putting all of that together, we can bring our factor of pi over two out front, and then we have the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity, minus one to the n, 
And then let's rewrite this half choose in using the definition of the binomial coefficient. So that'll be one half times minus half times minus three halves all the way down to one half minus n plus one over n factorial. So again, that's the definition of this binomial coefficient. And then we just discussed what we got from repeatedly reducing this integral. That will give us 2n minus 1 times 2n minus 3, all the way down 3 times 5 times 1 over 2n times 2n minus 2, all the way down 4 times 2. And then finally, we have a k to the 2n on the outside. So that's where we are so far. I wanna make one more change to this before we move to the top of the next board. And that is I'll take these n minus ones and I'll distribute them among these n terms from this product. So doing that, I'll have a minus half here and then I'll have a positive half here and a positive three halves here all the way ending at, let's see, it'll be minus one half plus n minus one. Okay, good. So now let's bring that information to the top and then we're ready to like wrap it up. So this is where we ended on the last board. Now we're ready to manipulate this a little bit more. So I wanna take this term right here, which I'm boxing in pink and rewrite it slightly. So I'm going to take each of these even terms and factor a 2 out and combine them with the odd terms in the top. So that's going to give me something that looks like this. 1 half times 3 halves times 5 halves. Let's notice we end at 2n minus 1 over 2. So that's exactly a rising factorial, which we'll note in the next step. And then after doing that, we're left with 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up to n in the denominator. So that's exactly n factorial. Okay, so now we can rewrite this in its final form. So we'll have pi over 2, and then we have the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity. Let's notice that this guy right here is a product of n terms that are ascending by 1 and starting at minus half. But that's exactly this rising factorial. So this guy right here is exactly the rising factorial minus 1 half n. So that's good. And then let's look at this one. So like I said, that one is also a rising factorial. There are n total terms. It starts at 1 half instead of minus half. So this is the rising factorial 1 half n. Okay, and then in the denominator, we have an n factorial and another n factorial. But let's rewrite that second n factorial as the rising factorial starting at 1. So those are the same. And then we finally have k to the 2n. But now looking at this, compared with our definition of the hypergeometric function, we see that we have exactly the result that we're going for. And that's a good place to stop.